begin. Got it. I'm going to mute you all too, if you don't mute yourselves. So to begin with, can people see that? Yeah. Yeah. Red shank, red shank dupes. I don't go, I'm going to enlarge it here. So, okay, well, thank you everyone for joining in this morning. This is a it's, a, it's a good subject and I'll claim in a moment that all, all natural history subjects are good subjects. But when I learned, it's, uh, it is, I think it was the Dukes that got me into realizing that I didn't know anything about primates about you know maybe four years ago something like that and so in the winter i must say i have time and um so i you know and you have the internet so i started looking into it and i i put together a little paper called the uh, primate families which as you will see in a moment here is available on at the Mental naturalist website and that's to get oriented which is what this is about too getting oriented i mean so so these red shank dukes they come up again that's just the opening picture but check them out they're considered to be the well the queen of the primates i hate to think who the king is and uh the most beautiful of all primates so look at those things they have red le lower legs black upper legs gray bodies white forearms and black hands and a red ring around their neck i mean what an astonishing creature oh, it lives mostly in vietnam uh which is problematic and that problem does come up. So yeah, at the beginning, a few notes here. I'm not an expert, I'm just interested in primates. Uh, hopefully I'm gonna move along quickly. There's 40 slides, actually they're numbered so you'll know where we are. Um, I think I might've mentioned in the email I sent to the naturalist list that uh, I couldn't avoid talking about environmental issues. I don't, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but there's a couple of fairly heavy slides towards the end because uh, 60 or 70% of all the primates in the world are endangered. Uh, and so if you're gonna talk about primates, you're gonna have to admit the fact <laughs> that we have some pretty pressing environmental issues. Um, and yeah, it evolved. I, I put it together about 10 days ago and that's not, that's not a good idea because then they have 10 days to think about it. And so, I kept adding things uh, like, not this, I didn't add this. So these are some resources and I'm gonna show this slide again at the end in case you wanna write them down, it'll show a little longer at the end. And I wanted to point out for those who don't know, if you hit the print screen button on your computer, it'll print that, it'll make it put that on your clipboard and then you can you know save it if you wanna remember any of this. So there is an eight page primate families at the Meta Naturalist, you just Google Meta Naturalist and then there's a column on the left side uh, there was an issue on the Mehanatris primates in North America. It, there's a picture of it later on. I'm recommending a book uh, called Reality Blind. If you Google, the name of the book is Reality Blind, the author's Nate Hagens. If you Google that, it's available for free online. It comes up in the slideshow. You'll see why I'm interested in it. And then these videos. Well, my absolute favorite monkey is the golden snub-nosed monkey. And those are the last three slides, this golden snub-nosed monkey that lives only in the mountains in China. So there's a video, 44 minute video. If you, you know, Google that forest of the gold monkey and you'll get it. The second video, this endangered monkey is uh, about dupes, the picture I showed. And then a great series, there's six part series. Well, I got downloaded it in six parts on YouTube. If you Google clever monkeys, but I can only find two, three and four right now. They're eight minutes long, very worthwhile. This is a slide I added because I had too much time. Uh, people, some of you have seen this before because I use it in my slides. So uh, this is the evolutionary journey. It's a fish coming out of water, an amphibian, an amphibian turning into a reptile, a reptile turning into a primate, a primate turning into a great ape who wonder, stands up on his back to two, two legs and wonders what it's all about. And what struck me, the reason I pulled this up is because when we talk about these primates, their primary concerns are eat, survive, reproduce. And you know, that is the biological story of life. You can argue that there's more space there. And I think that the, the, the one species that shows the greatest difference in flexibility is Homo sapiens, our species. 
not just that we wonder what it's all about, but that we can stand back and see this happening. So I pulled up this, this quote came to mind by John Muir. And this is a little different than Eat, Survive, Reproduce. John Muir, you know about John Muir. He said, how interesting everything is. Every rock, mountain, stream, plant, lake, forest, garden, bird, beast, insect, everything is interesting. And so that's the potential for Homo sapiens is to get turned on to the planet and not just eat, survive, reproduce. So I'm trying to make this thing go forward and it's stuck. I don't know why. This is actually the first slide. <laughs> So do you just see there's there's more primates? You know, I should have asked you to guess because uh, I could not have guessed. So it says about 400 species and then in parentheses because, you know, 300 to 500 because there's lumpers and splitters. You remember lumpers and splitters and people argue over whether these are um, subspecies or unique species. And that's why the numbers vary. But there are about 400 species and there's a lot of them in that picture. And um, they're all fascinating uh, and uh, have populated much of the world as we shall see. So uh, primates, well, primates are mammals. I thought just a brief review. What's a mammal? Mammals have hair. They, they take particularly good care of their young. They have mammary glands and they feed milk to their young, all mammals. Look at the range of mammals. The smallest mammal in the world is a mouse lemur, which is a primate. Pygmy marmoset, another primate. Blue whales, 150 tons. That's the range of mammals, but they all produce milk. They all have few offspring. They all have relatively large brains for their body size and few, off, yeah, few offspring. And they tend to take, there tends to be parental care for the offspring. And what came to mind is the other end of that extreme, I read this, there's a sunfish, you know, that huge, big, flat fish lives in the ocean. It lays three, three million eggs at one time. And, and it doesn't stick around to take care of any of them. <laughs> and that's the way evolution is. Evolution tries everything. Evolution tries everything. So, oh, I wanted to, another challenge here, mammals. First line there, it's one of seven classes of vertebrates. I could never have guessed what the other six are. You can get, if you work at it, you can get five classes of vertebrates. Like, okay, birds, birds aren't mammals. That's two, mammals and birds. How about amphibians? You can only get to five. <laughs> you can't get to seven. Uh, I have it written down and I know what they are and I'm not gonna tell you, but I'm just saying, you know, I've learned all this and you just forget it. I wish, I wish we, we're more entranced by biology, you know, and spent more of our time thinking about life on the planet and less about our problems. So primates, what defines a primate? Uh, separates it from mammals. Actually, interestingly enough, opposable thumbs are a big deal because then you can m m grab items and manipulate them, use them in different ways. And opposable toes, except for homo sapiens. Homo sapiens don't have opposable toes, probably because we're so, uh, evolved to walk on our feet. And we, we used to have, I mean, not we homo sapiens, but other organisms uh, in our evolutionary line had opposable toes. Stereoscopic vision. So those eyes are, face, are facing forward. That's very interesting. A lot, a lot of animals, especially prey animals, animals that are herbivores that are eaten by carnivores have their eyes on the side. So they have peripheral vision. They can see behind them. The primate line gave that up. And so I guess they must not have been overly preyed upon and they could afford stereoscopic vision. Stereoscopic vision gives you depth perception so that you can see how far away something is. If you need to leap through the trees, which a lot of primates have needed that, you can tell how far away it is. These are things that define mammals. And then few offspring and high level of parental care. So that's a few of, of the 400 primates and ones we don't know much about. I, I've read about these now. I still don't know anything about a podo. <laughs> Here's a little bit of an evolutionary tree for primates. Uh, you can break them down into five evolutionary groups. And so an early evolutionary group, and we'll find out why in a minute, are lemurs. And we all have heard of lemurs and seen pictures of lemurs and we're charmed by lemurs. Lemurs only exist on the island of Madagascar, interestingly enough. 
and lorises are over there with them. I also don't know much about lorises. I tried to look them up. I just couldn't get much information. And so the five groups would be lemurs and lorises, tarsiers, old world monkeys. Those are the ones we're most familiar with. New world monkeys. Somehow monkeys got to the new world. We don't know how. And then the apes. There are lesser apes, which are gibbons and greater apes. That would be us. So we're going to go through these, these groups. So lemurs, well, there's more lemurs than you would think, 100 species, about 100 species. It's so interesting, you know, I have all these notes and I highlighted points, but then when I get into these programs, I just hope I can remember. I don't like looking at notes. Uh, well, interestingly enough, so lemurs are only on the island of Madagascar. Humans made it to Madagascar about 2,000 2, years ago. There are about 20 species of lemurs that have already gone extinct, and they tend to be large ones in that drawing of lemur with a white background. There were lemurs that were as large as gorillas, and humans killed them and ate them. And that's not uncommon, you know, where humans first arrived in new lands. There tended to be a die-off of large mammals that happened in North America and happened in Australia. But there's lots of lemurs left, but they're all endangered. All lemurs are endangered. And that is because lemurs are on the island of Madagascar. It's an island, has a population of 28 million people. And the growth rate is 2.5% per year. I don't know if you remember how growth rates work, but that's a doubling time of about 26 years. So those 28 million could be 50 million. So it's, uh, it's, it's just, an, you know, eat, survive, reproduce. That was that cartoon slide in the beginning. We've got that down. <laughs> There's room to grow in other realms. So interestingly enough, this is a little, a little biogeography. And boy, that really, these things just are increasingly interesting when you learn about them. So Madagascar was joined to India, which was part of Africa. And it says there, uh, India broke off from Africa 150 million years ago, well, India is nowhere near Africa now. It went up through the Indian Ocean and ran into Asia and continued to push and formed the Himalayas. Madagascar was a part of India when it broke off and then it broke off. So I have some names. So I put lemurs there. Lemurs only exist, interestingly enough, they only exist on Madagascar, even though it was joined to India and India was joined to Africa some other names here. So in India, there's monkeys and lorises. Now the biogeography of that, I do not know. The monkeys would have come from Africa, why there's monkeys in India, but not in, ah. Uh, you know, one thing I don't know about, so that up on the top there, it's just monkeys, lorises, and tarsiers. That's in Asia, outside of India, and then over here in Africa, monkeys and lorises. Well, the, why are there monkeys? In India, I don't know for sure that India arrived so long ago in Asia. I think it was 50 million years ago, it started to crash into Asia. Monkeys might have walked there, to tell you the truth. They might not have floated on the, on the, when India was an island. Anyhow, it's biogeography and it is interesting, but I don't know the details. It's a few very charismatic lemurs. So an evolutionary trend with primates is reduction of olfactory capacity, the, the length of the snout and the power of smell, and an increase in the power of sight and the size of the brain. Well, lemurs still have long snouts and, and scent is very important to them and they use it in their social structure. The ring-tailed lemur, I've and having read about, it, I just thought it was somewhat amusing. It puts a, a very powerful scent on its tail and they, the males go into a bit of a fight and they, they have what they call a stink fight and wave their tails and try and drive the other males away. So the numbers there are the remaining population. So ringtail lemurs, even though it's one of the species we're more familiar with, because um, we've just because we've seen pictures of it, there's only 2,000 of them left, co-corrals. 
So I, get, I think Safaka is pronounced Shafaka. Some of you, some few of you would probably know that for sure. But, and it comes from a sound they make. So it's, lemurs can walk on their hind legs and Shafakas do with their arms over their head. You've probably seen pictures of it. They hop along with their hands over their head and they make this sound, Shafaka, Shafaka, Shafaka. That's where the name comes from. Yeah, that, oh, uh, I'm remembering. I wanted to comment on the social structure as I was able to find out about it. So um, lemurs tend to be female dominated. Most of the species, this, they're, they, you know, they live in social groups, small social groups of up to about 30. Females tend to dominate. And that's you know, interesting for Homo sapiens to contemplate. And it varies as you go through the, spe through the primates. Uh, it just varies from one group to another. Lorses, um, I could find out embarrassing little about Boris, Boris, Lorses, it's just that they exist. And I think they showed up in Africa and India and there in Asia. Uh, they're nocturnal creatures that um, are not considered to be monkeys. They have their own little evolutionary line. That's true for tarsiers too. Tarsiers are not in the family of African monkeys. They have their own family, Tarsiidae. They're not in Africa. They're only on the big islands off the coast of Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia. How they got there, I do not know. Uh, an interesting fact about tarsiers is each eye is bigger than its brain. So they're probably nocturnal creatures oriented towards uh, night living. They're insectivores and herbivores. They eat plant material and go around catching insects at night, which takes good vision. So there was, we did it. There was an issue of the naturalist. This is, I can't see, some years ago, five years ago. Um, so it was a little bit of a joke when I put in the Methow watershed. There aren't very many primate species in the Methow watershed, but the fact that Homo sapiens is in the Methow watershed, well, they, you know, that the, really that's the story there would be the Native Americans and, and how they made their way to North America and to the Methow. I think that's what that refers to. So the interesting thing about the title primates in North America is the oldest known primate fossil on the planet is in Montana, found in Montana. And it's lemur-like. So remember that the continent, and it's 60, 66 million years old. Well, the asteroid hit, assuming it did hit, and it does seem that it did, the one that is thought to have taken out the dinosaurs or been the final blow for the dinosaurs, that was 62 million years ago. So once these large carnivores were removed from the planet, the smaller semi-nocturnal organisms were able to uh, proliferate. And the, the, the continents were in different positions. Uh, I looked it up and so this, I said the, the oldest known primate fossil is one called Purgatorius, which is just that named after a place in Montana. Purgatory Hill fossil site. Um, 66 million years ago, I think North America was not joined to Europe, but it had been previously. And there might have been a land bridge across, even across Greenland at that time. And there was no ice on Greenland. Everything changes. And so how these animals got around is, you know, a study, but you can imagine the possibilities. So one of the families of monkeys are the New World monkeys. Oh, they're in five families. One of the groups is New World monkeys. Well, how do New World monkeys get to the New World? We do not know. And they are not closely related to those primates that evolved in North America. They're more closely related to African monkeys. So somehow they made it from Africa and it's not known how, but Africa, Africa and South America were closer together. Uh, so New World monkeys arrived about 45 million years ago. Um, they, the, I don't know what the distance was, but it wasn't what it is today. And it's thought maybe just one species floated on a raft of vegetation that was blown across the ocean. 
So there's five families. I put up just one family there. I'm going to pull the other ones up, but trying not to confuse you too much, but just these groups exist. These have all probably radiated, evolved from a single group of monkeys that arrived on a raft of vegetation 45 million years ago. And that's what life does. It, very, it changes over time. So we've heard of howlers. Uh, and that makes up uh, howlers along with, uh, I think, spider monkeys. These tamarins have their own family. And they go with that little marmoset that I showed. And we'll be looking a little more at these. One slide for each. Squirrel monkeys, it's a family. And so the number of species are there. There's about 100 total New World monkeys. And these are the five families. And those are the numbers. And that shows you the, the infinite variation in the evolutionary journey if these all evolved from one group of one species that were landed by chance probably in South America 45 million, 45 million years ago. So this one family, tamarins, these are tamarins and that tiny, well, the next slide shows these tiny marmosets uh, is one of the families, very charismatic. I remember that. I think the golden lion tamarin lives only in the Atlantic rainforest along the Atlantic coast, which is an endangered rainforest. So you can imagine the golden lion tamarin is endangered. So a fascinating social aspect of these creatures is that um, the females are polyandrous. They're small social groups. I think a very small, like six to 10. The female mates with more than one male. They often have twins. The paternity then is not known for sure. And the males participate almost equally in the raising of the offspring. That's very unusual and a very unusual social structure, but anything goes in the world of nature. And I, it says that in some species, the male takes more care of the offspring than the female. And it has to do with being polyandrous and not knowing for sure who the, what the paternity is and the interest that organisms have in ha having their offspring survive. Here's marmosets, must be, let's see, I guess that, what that tarsier was one ounce in these pygmy marmosets, two ounces. So those are two babies on the fingers and the full grown marmoset with a baby on the back. They actually feed, they actually have a home range of a half an acre. It's like a squirrel, but they're not squirrels, they're primates. And they feed on tree exudates, they say, it would be tree sap. They chew a little hole. In the, on, the, on the side of the tree and come back the next day and the tree is oozing out sap and that's their primary food source. Looking into them, I was interested to find this page. If you wanna buy a marmoset, I'm not recommending that. I just found it interesting that this is a primate farm in Texas. And while it seems extremely distasteful at first, these people, uh, have really learned their business and they breed a large variety of endangered primates and they do sell them, but they, they also supply them to zoos, which may not seem overly inviting at first blush, but zoos have become one of the primary conservation sites on the planet for endangered species because the habitat loss is so severe for many species. So at least it's not all bad. I would not buy a marmoset, but <laughs> I was interested to see that they were, such a thing existed. And look at these creatures. <laughs> Doesn't, nothing gets more charming than that. So another family, a teledae. Yeah, black howlers. There's various howlers and spider monkeys. So these creatures have evolved these various behaviors for survival in the forest where they can't see one another. And they dare not go, they don't spend much time on the ground. They're mostly arboreal. So how are you gonna communicate? Well, the howler solution was loud noise. And it turns out that the black howler is the loudest animal on the planet. Loudest, probably animal, mammal. Uh, it's, its voice carries for three, three miles. And is 140 decibels, and a jet engine is 150 decibels. <laughs> so you can see these things on YouTube, howling, and man, that will break your eardrums. And that's a way to, you know, to 
communicate within the troop, but also between troops to claim territory. And that's, you know, that's, uh, that's a common issue with primates. If you noticed that in the news this morning, there's still struggle for territory and security. And it goes on with all primates probably, including our own. Let's see, okay, I cleverly put numbers on there. Just gonna check here if I'm missing anything too important. So the, I think most of this family there, the social, the reproductive social structure is uh, dominant male. And that would be the most common among the primates, dominant male with a small harem who dominates those females and is able to rule the group and subdue the other males and only one male mates, but small group, I'm not sure how big, uh, probably five or 10 total in a howler group. But so coming to terms, that has to, all organisms have to come to terms with that question of reproduction and care, care of offspring or no care of offspring uh, and parental investment. And it's done uh, in a wide variety of ways. Another new world family, Cibidae, squirrel monkeys and capuchins. Capuchins are named after um, monks because of that little cap on their head. It reminded the early people who saw them, early Europeans of capuchin monks. So if I could have shown you the video, um, if we had time, I would have shown you, there's a section in Clever Monkeys, uh, these, these capuchins, various species of capuchins, which there are a number of species, uh, they have sites in South America where they crack open palm nuts with rocks and they bring the rocks, a, a, it's a rounded rock from the river and they carry it to a flat surface, flat rocky surface. And they use those sites over and over again to crack these nuts. So tool use is considered to be a sign of increased intelligence. Most animals on the planet don't use tools. And so there's pictures of, in Clever Monkeys, there's pictures of these things cracking these nuts and it's quite entertaining to see. So this unknown family, well, most of us have never heard of these creatures, Pythaceidae, 40 species, Sakis, Titis, and Uakaris. Two species of Uakaris, I remember, I forget, Sakis and so as with most of these monkeys, they're arboreal, they live in the trees. They've evolved these, uh, even this uh, appearance is often sexually, select, sexually selected traits for communicating various aspects of each survivor reproduce, often reproduce with the other members of the troop uh, and with females of the troop. So reading about this Uakari, what a strange creature down there in the bottom, the explanation that I found, what, and it said sort of that scientists think the most likely explanation is the degree of vividness of the red face communicates to the females of the troop the health of that individual and uh, would make that male more desirable to mate with. Females would tend to choose that male if their face was redder. Just a way to communicate when you can't speak an, a language. <laughs> so old world, that was uh, five families of new world monkeys all evolved from probably one arrival. There's three families in the old world and the large one is that down there at the bottom, it says old world monkeys, 138 species. So that's the largest species of primates. And it's most of the monkeys we've heard about probably fit into that Cercopithecidae. Uh, but there are three other families, two other families, this, the lesser apes, gibbons, 13 species of gibbons. And then the great apes, which is our group. And there's only eight species of great apes, interestingly enough. Well, there's 138 species of 
monkeys, and I think I have a few. So of orangutans, there's three species. That's fairly recent news. I think the third species was just added about 15 years ago, an island in, in Indonesia. Gorillas, how many species of gorillas do you think there are? Two. Homo sapiens, one. And there are two species of chimps. So great apes and lesser apes. So the gibbons, oops, gibbons is spelled wrong. Gibbons are lesser apes. Uh, it doesn't hinge on much to be a lesser ape. They're smaller. They're not as, they're not as large, don't weigh as much, uh, but they still have the traits of the apes. They're large organisms. They have large brain size, few offspring. And we are gonna talk briefly about these. So this is, this is in the large group of monkeys. And this is what I particularly, these toke macaques are in Sri Lanka. And I particularly wanted to show the clever monkey video. We tried that before you, the rest of you came online and it said that we had the wrong format and we can't show it, but there's just a two, two minute section. And I do recommend the videos and you can if you look long enough. You may find the whole program on YouTube, but they live, they interact with people and they're on the streets and they're, they're on the temples. Uh, but they're also endangered. Surprisingly to me, they're endangered. And uh, it's because of loss of habitat on Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is an island. Habitat loss in island is always gonna be some of the worst. I'm looking to... So they have a highly, highly stratified social structure, both males and females. And so an interesting point with that is so that they know who the dominant males are and they know who the dominant females are. And that's going to be related to age, strength and health. And the interesting thing about that to me is that the offspring of the dominant females get better sustenance in the context of living in a monkey troop than the non-dominant females. They're, they're more likely to survive. So this theme of domination and hierarchy is woven through uh, primates. And so, you know, I mean, some of these things obviously reflect on our own species and our own struggles to find a way to live peacefully on the planet. Yeah, so a number of these species, when they live around humans, one of the problems they have is they're used for target practice. And so, especially in times of violence. So there was a big, you know, war in, on Sri Lanka about 15 years ago, I forget exactly when, but these monkeys were used for target practice. Baboons. This is a Hamadryas baboon. It's on that map. I circled it with a red circle. It's up there in Ethiopia and actually extends over into uh, the Arabian Peninsula. There's six species of baboons in that picture. I'm not, I'm not sure how many total species there are. But these still are in the large family of um, African monkeys, 138 species. These, these move around in very large groups. Of, a fascinating aspect of these and the next creature, which is called the galata, which is like a baboon, baboon-like. Look at the canines on that male. These things are vegetarians. And briefly, I'm gonna show you the galata. Look at those, look at those canines. So, they're vegetarians. Galatas live on grass. <laughs> what are the canines for? Canines are sexually selected traits for power and strength, for being able to express dominance in the social group. So these Hamadryas baboons, they male dominant, male being a harem with ten, up to 10 females. So the dominant male will be the only one to breed. So they know, so they know the paternity and he'll watch over those. Probably not much parental care from that dominant male, but make sure that the offspring get the sustenance they need. Uh, those harems will join together into clans of up to 100. The clans join together into bands of up to 400. And the bands join into troops of up to 1,000. So extremely social. They come together and go apart. Uh, but extremely social organisms and um, high level of dominance hierarchy, which is tr very true for galatas as well. This is a baboon-like creature, but not a baboon. 
lives in Ethiopia. It eats unbelievably. Look at those canines. These things live 90% on grass. They're like a horse or a cow. <laughs> so the only use for those canines are uh, establishing dominance and maintaining dominance. And most of that's done with threat displays. They don't have to fight all that often. They can figure out who the dominant organism is. And, um, and that male will dominate its harem. I forget the size with galatas. Uh, 15 in a harem, mostly females. So they're able to communicate through uh, facial expression like that male is showing, but also those red patches brighten up when they're dominant. And when females are ready to breed, that's a female off to the left there with that male, that red patch brightens up when it's ready to breed. So it's each survive, reproduce out there. Speaking of which, did you know there were mandrels in the world <laughs> and drills? So in this particular case, Charles Darwin said, no other member of the whole class of mammals is colored in such an extraordinary manner. The rainbow rumps are colored red, pink, blue, and purple. What has to be the least subtle example of sexual signaling in the animal kingdom. So that's what that's about. It's about, these are males. This is about communicating to the females in the troop, the, the, the vitality of that male. And in fact, the dominant male turns these bright colors. And when, when a dominant male becomes non-dominant, is overthrown, the colors fade. And so while it seems a little mm, unsavory, you know, sometimes these color signals are ways of establishing dominance without fighting, without actually having to kill your opponent. That's what that's about. So astonishing creatures, but in both endangered. Mandrels, 20,000 left and drills. Drills at 4,000, so drills live in Nigeria, and I knew Nigeria had issues, so I looked it up. The population of Nigeria is 218 million people, and the reproductive, the, the, the uh, growth rate is 2.5. It's down from three and 2.7, but it's 2.5, that's a doubling time of about 25 years. So that could be pushing over 400 million in 25 years. So, you know, we're still shackled with those, that drive that I showed in the cartoon, he'd survive, reproduce, and less uh, able to enjoy the planet. So yeah, I pulled up this red sports car because I thought, you know, you can see the sexual signaling in Homo sapiens as well. It's like, you know, not that different than the red butt on a drill. So this uh, Gibbons offer a little relief because they form monogamous pairs. That doesn't that, isn't that comforting? And, and can form monogamous pairs for life. And so they don't struggle with the kind of dominant, dominance uh, that plagues some of the other animal groups. This is 24. Uh, the, the fascinating thing about their aerial specialists, the way that they can swing their arms and they can travel, they can, they can, they can swing 50, uh, not 50 miles, 50 feet through the trees at 35 miles an hour and then swing again. They don't have to stop at that point. They can just, they can travel through the canopy of the trees at 35 miles an hour. What a phenomenal thing. Yeah, long-term pair bonds. So very different than the kind of social structures that we've visited previously. Orangutans were back to male dominance these are the three species of orangutans, and these are dominant males with these cheek pads, which form in only in dominant males. And if they lose their dominance, then the cheek pads deflate. And, uh, you know, it's a way of sexual signaling and not having to fight to establish dominance. Um, I'm surprised I didn't put the numbers in there, but the numbers are not high. They're uh, arboreal, almost completely arboreal. They're rarely on the ground orangutans. And of course, the, the world's, well, Indonesian, mostly Indonesia, I think the rainforests are not in the best shape. So orangutans are, I'm sure, threatened. See if I can pick up any 
Oh yeah. So they're considered to be very dominant. I mean, excuse me, very intelligent. And that, and the measure of that is their use of tools and they use a variety of tools for a variety of purposes, including nap, including leaves to wipe their face, <laughs> napkins, and uh, 20 kinds of tools for preparing fruit. If they need to crack the fruit open, they have 20 different kinds of tools, 50 different kinds of tools for accessing honey they've been seen to use. So it's interesting that that's a sign of um, both that, that, that that's a sign of intelligence to use, you know, utilizing the environment, using, using aspects of the environment to uh, improve your own well being. And of course, Homo sapiens is the premier example of that. <clears throat> but it's interesting how much brain power it takes to, you know, we're so impressed. You've seen pictures of the chimps when, when it was fig, when chimps were first seen, we're coming on chimps, but when they were first seen to use a blade of grass to stick into a termite hole. It was considered revolutionary. I mean, that's like 30 million years of evolution to figure out to use a blade of grass. Gorillas. This, this is a range of gorillas and which gorilla is where. So on the map, it just shows a scientific name. And if it says gorilla, gorilla, gorilla for the red one, that's a subspecies. Gorilla, gorilla is a species. Gorilla beringii is another species. And then the third name is a subspecies. So they're closely related. You can see the range of the two species. The, the subspecies are close together, but they've been separated by some physical phenomenon that allowed them to differentiate enough to, to, act, to either be different species or the splitters decided they were different species. So down at the bottom, our names. So the one we're familiar with is the third one, the mountain gorilla. So it says there's a thousand left. The interesting thing about that is it's actually good news because there were fewer. They were down to about 100 or 800 and they're up to about a thousand. And you know, it's a struggle to protect them. And so their range, let's see, they're gorilla beringii, beringii. They're the blue color on that map. They have almost no range whatsoever. They're in the highlands in those countries, which I forget which countries those are. Uh, and then they, there's a, Western lowland gorilla, red coloration, 100,000. Uh, Eastern lowland gorilla, 4,000 next to the mountain gorilla, which they, the two have speciated, you know, by being separated by habitat. But they're all endangered because the human population is growing so rapidly and habitat loss. So here, I had this picture. And so Western, lowland gorilla and an eastern lowland gorilla and i don't know if i got this off the web or if i put this together because i've had this for a few years but i realized that 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 gorilla on the right is not a lowland gorilla it's a mountain gorilla because they grow long hair so i went online and looked and i found a picture of an eastern lowland gorilla and there you have it but the difference here in these two species so western and eastern are two different species and the mountain is the same species as an eastern beringii but look at the nose. That's how you can tell the difference in the species. That was a point of interest to me that you can tell the species apart that the Western lowland and that cross river species, subspecies have this nose, maybe, well, they're both heart shaped, but they have these flanges on them. They're just a different shape, flattened flange and a, maybe a thicker flange on the Eastern lowland. And that, that so, so, so that's a, on the right there is a mountain gorilla. And so this Eastern lowland has a nose that's similar because they are the same species. They're both Beringii. Mountain gorilla, cross river gorilla. So very few cross, gorilla, cross river gorillas left. They're related to the Western lowland. Chimpanzees. <clears throat> There's two species of chimpanzees. These we're a little more familiar with, and you probably know what they are. There's the one we call what we call a common common chimpanzee, and all the colors there in the map are common chimpanzees except the green color at the lower portion, and those are bonobos. So bonobos are a, a separate species, and really the so they and let's see they speciated. So chimpanzees and bonobos. You've seen, you've heard this more than once. 
we share about 99% the same genetic code with both of these species. And scientists have said that Homo sapiens should probably be in the same genus. You know, if it didn't embarrass us, if it didn't embarrass us, they put us in the same genus as uh, common chimpanzees and bonobos were so similar. So we can learn something about ourselves by watching the behavior of these two. Well, the behavior of these two species, so they're split by the Congo River. You can't quite see it on the map, but it arcs up above the range of the bonobos, which is in green there, and it, and it split them into, into two species and they evolved into the behaviorally, markedly different species that behave in such stunningly different ways. And I think it shows the plasticity of behavior in our evolutionary group. And I'm saying that as a good thing because we need a little plasticity. We need to you know, continue to develop our ability to live on the planet as stewards and, and enjoying it and not so much as each survivor reproduce, which was the original order, the original order from the biosphere. So here's pictures of those two organisms. So the interesting thing about these species is the chimpanzees, common chimpanzees, are very hierarchical society, male dominated. There's one male that dominates the troop and he'll mate, he'll be the only one to mate with the females unless another male can sneak in, which they will do. But it uh, also defines the paternity of the offspring and that male will guard those offspring and make sure they get the sustenance they need. The bonobos are almost the opposite. While, they're, while there's there's much to be said about bonobos, and not that I'm any expert on them, but there's a lot of variability. But the bottom line is, ultimately, they're matriarchal. The dominant, the dominant individual is an elder female. And then there's a sort of a, almost a committee of elder males and females that work together. And, and it's a, as, you, as you have heard, it's a highly sexual species and will use sex and use sex in all ways between males and females between males and males and between males and female between females and females to bond and to resolve uh disputes so a completely different organism than the common chimpanzee which just lives across the river so you can't say anything categorical about these but i thought i'd share the statement by franz de wall Primatologist, and you may remember his name, he's famous and I'm sure he's still alive. He studied them a lot. <clears throat> he says they're cap the bonobos are capable of altruism, compassion, empathy, kindness, patience, and sensitivity. And describe bonobo society as a gynocracy, which I take to be a democracy of females, <laughs> right across the river from the common chimpanzees, which are, you know, the opposite. Both of these, by the way, are mostly vegetarian. You know, we, I think we probably, you people here today have heard about the common chimpanzee and how violent they can be. They will take out, if they, if they encounter a chimpanzee from another troop, they'll kill it. And that's just territoriality. It's what's going on in the news today, to some degree. I don't, shouldn't go there with that. But um, it's an issue for organisms on the planet, territoriality, and, and maintaining enough territory that you can get the resources you need for you and your offspring to survive. Well, Chimpanzees will kill. Chimpanzees will kill uh, members of other troops and tear them to pieces and eat them. Actually, and bonobos will have sex. That's a generalization, but there is some truth to it. So, two pictures of the dukes. I was just so taken with this. This is a the other duke, Grayshank Duke, and see, it doesn't have those uh, fancy leggings, black and red, but it's still just a tremendously gorgeous organism. Uh, look, uh, it's unfortunate for it that it lives in Vietnam, which I'm going to tell you why you can imagine why. Um, oh, this was so cute. <clears throat> so the Dukes uh, use various <laughs> um, facial expressions to indicate that they're ready to copulate. And one of them is just to raise their eyebrows. I thought that was so cute that they just raise their eyebrows at one another. And if, if they brush, raise their eyebrows, then they're ready to copulate. And they, pro, their jaw protrudes and a few things like that. But you know, these organisms have to communicate and they don't speak English. So that's how they do it. Um, 
so then you get into the you know the the myth myth making mind of homo sapiens by which i mean what i'm seeing here in my notes is that that they're the, the bones of the dukes are considered by the asians to be a remedy in a way for what ails you i mean i have some lack of appetite insonomia anemia some more things here you know they aren't actually good for that but hum, humans live in, in a way a mythological existence and they just make these things up about other organisms so these dukes are killed for for their bones and the bones are ground up to you know deal with your insonomia and then the red shank duke so beautiful 300 300 left well they're i think the primary center for population growth is just vietnam they extend out into cambodia and laos but so the next two slides are a little tough and it's the environmental issue, but you know, I thought we should, we should try it on for size. We should consider it. So this, oops, yeah. This is uh, the weight of mammals on the planet. If you were to weigh all the mammals, 60% would be livestock, 36% would be humans and 4% wild mammals. So why are 60% why are of the primates endangered? This is why, because, because you know, the, the ecological term for the condition of homo sapiens on the planet is overshoot. We have overshot the carrying capacity. The only reason that there's eight billion cells, which is one time inheritance of energy and energy is the essential element of life. Without energy, you can't do anything. And we built this social structure on this one time inheritance of fossil fuels. I'm not gonna go into that and you know about that. But it, that's what has allowed us to dominate. And the only reason they're the livestock, of course, is because they're there for humanity. But that's why these so many creatures are endangered. We're an overshoot. Well, we aren't, we aren't born knowing this term overshoot. And that is part of the, you know, the human species learning to live on the planet. And I think, you know, that's a hopeful thing. This is less hopeful. <clears throat> so why are there so few dukes? Gray shanked and red shanked dukes. This is a map of the bombing of Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War. And this is a map of the spraying of herbicide in Vietnam. And I apologize for putting this in front of you, but it's not, a, it's not really, I'm not implicating going back to the Vietnam War. It's the mythological, I'm, I'm referring now to the way the human mind works and how we make things up. You know, these people were rice farmers who made $200 a year and they were 5,000 miles from us. And we made, we were, were so, it's part of the same dominance hierarchy and struggle for territory that we see in the other primates, but it's in hypertrophy, which is a real word, you know, it's overblown in homo sapiens. So I'm just pointing out that it exists and it's mythological. A lot of these problems aren't, you know, we did not have, this war did not have to happen, but this is why there's so few dukes because we, we sprayed 20 million acres of their, of their, right. So this is, this is, this is a reference to a book that's a new book. It's only been out for a month. It's called the, it's called Reality Blind. I put it in the references. It'll come up again. And that's what I was saying before. We're reality blind. You would not spray 20 million acres of the richest uh, ecosystem on the planet, the Southeast Asian tropical rainforest, if you were not reality blind, but we're blinded by this genetic message for dominance and territory. And so they talk about this in this book that I'm recommending called Reality Blind by Nate Hagens. If you just Google that much, you'll get the book. It's free. You download it for free. So they talk about Mr. Gene Agenda and they have this example in it. So this is a nest of robins. This is an example of um, the power of genes, of genetic messaging, of uh, behaviorally defined, uh, gene genetically defined behavior. So you know how it is with, with birds in a nest. The, the birds, the, the nestlings gape, the, the female, the, the feeding, the males and females see the gape and they respond to the gape and they stuff food down the bird's gullet. If you put a popsicle stick in a robin's nest with, with, with a beak painted red on it, the, the, the male and female robin will try and feed the popsicle stick and the babies will starve to death. It's just an example of the power of genetic programming and all organisms, all organisms are genetically programmed to fit into their environment. 
and it does seem like the the assignment for humanity is to overcome the genetic programming with intelligence which that's what this is a, you know a slide trying to illustrate and here is sapiens so i had to look up sapiens homo sapiens wise wise humans wise humans sagacious able to able to see a problem and resolve it <laughs> so that's what that book talks about reality blind i'm recommending it and we're easing out of those problems now and into a few just charming we're at the end of the slideshow and just these magnificent creatures but hilarious so the description were these was this is a tonkin snub-nosed monkey uh it said it gives the distinct impression this monkey has been applying heavy makeup without the aid of a mirror. <laughs> I mean, they are entertaining, <laughs> but also beautiful, but also almost extinct uh, because of habitat loss, because the human species is in a overshoot. And then this is the golden snub nosed monkey, which I became somehow particularly fond of. And uh, at least there's, they live in the high mountains in China. So they're in a little better shape. They are in this movie that you'll see again on the resource page if you want to watch it 44 minutes long. And I um, see if I can see anything here about their, their social structure. Actually, I don't think I know what their social structure is. It's small groups, small groups in the high mountains. Uh, so these pictures I actually took from that movie, you know, they're just screen capture shots, but I found it so interesting. It's, they're in the high mountains and it snows there. They live in the coldest environment of any primate other than Homo sapiens. And they walk, they walk around in the snow upright. Uh, I mean, mostly they're in the trees, but if they have to walk, they walk upright holding their babies. And they live on lichens and bark in the winter. So just uh, very charismatic, beautiful organism and that's a, another beautiful representation of this species i think we're at the end of the line this is not gonna i'm gonna go to the resource page so if you need to contact matt at home or me so with these resources i don't know you know if anybody just wants to jot anything down i'm gonna leave it there for a moment and that was just an hour and that's the story for our nearest relatives on the planet, all 400 species. <laughs>